Hey everybody, it's John from Narcotic Casserole. Just wanted to let you know, in this episode, and possibly even the next, uh, you might be hearing noises in the background that might sound like construction. Well, that's because construction's happening in my apartment complex, and unfortunately my microphone is really good. So, if you're wondering what that background noise is, that's exactly what that is. So, hopefully that will not interfere with your enjoyment of this episode. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. It was a time when artists like Orson Welles, John Houseman, and Diego Rivera were changing the rules. But when Washington decided to shut them down, no one should be afraid of an idea. The real drama began. For the first time in American history, the government has sent armed guards to prevent the performance of a play. When the storm breaks, the cradle will rock. Cradle will rock. Good morning to you on uh, Rare Delicacies. With me, as always, is... Brett. The first show we did together was uh, I'm Saving It for Paul. That was it, yeah. I played Paul McCartney, and you played a Beatle Maniac. Yeah. <laughs> in drag. And yet, in that mere second, you stole the show, running on stage going, <laughs> Mary B. Ringo! <laughs> and from there, our friendship was indeed formed. Uh, you were telling me, fascinatingly, that there was a show that you did, a musical that you did, an obscure one. Uh, that came out during Depression Era America, and that musical was? Cradle of Rock. When you say a musical, people today have a very different idea. Cradle of Rock is more along the lines of Three Penny Opera uh, than the musicals that, uh, that come through, uh, that uh, are done on Broadway and mm-hmm. are on stage today. I'm, I'm not sure as a, who was in the original cast. Well, actually, I can help you with that, because ah. the subject of today is the film Cradle of Rock, which was directed by Tim Robbins, mm. and it has an epic king-size cast, because this film is not just about the musical Cradle of Rock, but it's also about uh, the political climate and how it's affecting the artist community in New York City during the Depression era. It talks about everything, ranging from the union strikes, it there talks were, about... There were protests yeah. outside the theater. It talks about the Federal Theater Project, and how the government was sanctioning, and they were overseeing what kind of shows were being done all throughout all throughout Broadway and how it was actually affecting every even down to the fact that they had to interrupt right in the middle of rehearsals to do 15 minute union breaks yeah. at that time. This film also chronicles the famous incident when Nelson Rockefeller commissioned the artist Diego Rivera to paint the mural in Rockefeller Center. It, it's, a, it's one of those very kaleidoscopic films where it has a whole load of plot lines interweaving all throughout. But the ensemble cast so much so that I have to read it off the box here. Hank Azira, John Cusack, Joan Cusack, Carrie Elways, Angus McFadden, Bill Murray, uh, Vanessa Redgrave, Susan Sarandon, John Turturro, and Emily Watson. And that's still not everyone mentioned there. It came out in 1999. It, I don't remember it getting like so many raves that everyone was like going, it was one of the best films of the year, but frankly, I think they should have. I think the major awards consideration that it was getting for was Bill Murray's performance. In the film, Bill Murray plays a ventriloquist who's also rapidly paranoid about communism, and he's very protective of his act. He doesn't like the idea of people aping it because he thinks it's a, it's a communist activity, <laughs> but he kind of represents that the ill-informed people on the street who think they understand the problems and realizing they're just making it worse by being paranoid. So you've never heard of this film at all? Well, I have. I heard of the film. I've never seen it. It's very multifaceted. There's moments where it's really funny, very dramatic. All the performances across the board are spectacular. Mm. Um, actually, this is, for me, this is the first time I ever saw John Turturro. Mm. Anyway, because around this time I had not seen The Big Lebowski. I had not seen Barton Fink. I had not seen a lot of the stuff that we know John Turturro for. So this is the first time I saw him. And I was like, this guy, I need to see more of him. And lo and behold, surely enough, I ended up seeing uh, Big Lebowski afterwards, and I'm like, like, we need more John Turturro. Just not in the Nutcracker. It's all so unnecessary. Are you at home? Do you have your Blu-ray players? This is Great Little Rock. Until the final wind blows, and when the wind blows, the cradle will rock. That's thunder, that's lightning, and it's gonna surround you. No wonder those storm birds seem to circle around you. Well, you can't climb down and you can't say no. You can't stop the weather, not with all your dough. Oh, when the wind blows, oh, when the wind blows, the cradle will rock. 
So that that brought back memories. Oh man, I I was so digging the music, <laughs> oh, singing along with, and I mean also understand Cradle Will Rock is not only unlike a lot of um, the current uh, offerings of uh, of stage musicals uh, as a matter of form, but also as some of the music, you know, it was almost it was it's not not really atonal. Not all of it is like the real. You know, melodic toe tapping. Yeah, that you tend to associate with. The, yeah, it's not meant to be word. brassy or flashy. I mean, what did you think of the film as a whole? I mean, was it everything? I, I still remember um, the director uh, had also done a, a lot of uh, research, and I'm sitting there thinking, mm -hmm, "Yep, happened. Yeah, happened. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, this is again. This is Tim Robbins who directed. This is Nuke Lelouch who directed that. This is Filzy from Howard the Duck who directed this and it's it's a staggering piece of work and i'm really sad to be honest that this didn't doesn't get as much play as a lot of other agreed it's so much more ambitious and yeah we talk about the great depression we talk about the union strikes but we don't talk about that particular focus focus spot and this talked in about the federal theater project which i didn't even know existed yeah and to find out that the government were actually trying to over you know have oversight over what kind of plays people mm -hmm. watch for fear of, oh my God, the workers actually realizing that that we're being screwed over by the rich. Yeah. This is the first time I saw the actress Cherry Jones. Most people remember her from, um, she was the uh, president in season seven and, yeah, season seven to 24, I think season eight as well. And she was also in Signs. She was the sheriff in Signs. This actress is spectacular. <laughs> I loved all the scenes with her as when she pretty much made them all look like idiots when they all thought Christopher Marlowe was a yeah. communist. Yeah. I, I got a kick out of that. <laughs> Honestly, I would I would be shocked if there wasn't any kind of productions of Cradle Rock down the line that just wanted to recreate that first night. So this musical written by Mark Blitzstein was, well, it was pro-union. And not only that, it was pretty much a full-blown indictment of the upper class and their exploitation of workers. Because, you say exploitation? Uh, well, as Mark said, as Hank Azaria, as Mark here says, it's prostitution, to be more precise. Yeah, everybody yeah. is a whore. But what would it be to get you to compromise yeah. your integrity for the sake of, you know, of staying on top. Which I could imagine during the Great Depression, that was everyone's obsession, was finding a way to stay on top and not drown, mm -hmm. just for the sake of being able to have food on your plate. I and mean, the Fellow Three Theater Project obviously has some kind of noble intention, the idea of professional actors being able to have a steady job. Mm -hmm. It's just sad that the idea that the government has become so paranoid about the stuff that they're teaching, or that they're... Right. Showing that they can't well, even stand to have that. You know, since the money came from us, we have the prerogative of controlling content and this sort of thing. Yeah. Oh, never mind that this thing was written way before, you know, Marx and Engels came along. Who we don't need <laughs> No, no, they are obviously communist. Before there was you know, maybe Marx and maybe Marx and Engels were inspired by them. With the other subplot involving Diego Rivera and um Nelson Rockefeller with the uh, oh, yeah. with the yeah. mural. There, this one all, uh, chronicles, of course, the famous incident. Which, if you've seen the movie Frida, they get into pretty dang intensely um, about the incident when Nelson Rockefeller commissioned Diego Rivera, who is a notorious communist, um, to paint a mural, and he insisted on painting a syphilis cell hovering over the upper uh, an image of the upper class and uh, Lenin yeah. as well, because he considered him a revolutionary leader. Uh, kind of thing, and of course that didn't sit well with Rockefeller, who was in bed with friggin' uh, steel magnets and uh, not steel magnets, but magnates. Yeah, uh, and uh, William Randolph Hearst, who pretty much controlled controlled the outpouring of information, the real fake news. There's a segment in the film where Cherry Jones' character, who runs the Federal Theater, actually is totally pro this show called Revolt of the Beavers, where it's basically about a pair of about a land of beavers who. Uh, get back at a greedy at a greedy beaver who's trying to, I, from what I can imagine, exploit their... He's a big, fat, bad beaver. He's a big, fat, <laughs> bad beaver. And unfortunately, the play winds up getting maligned and ends up adding gas to the fire. Oh, they're they're pro-communist or pro-everything. you know, pro -everything. And she's just saying... Oh, they don't shoot the big, fat beaver. They just kick him out of beaver lands. So what does that say? Class war. It's a fairy tale. The big, fat beaver is a big, fat capitalist. The big, fat beaver is a bad, big, fat beaver. He is a greedy beaver. He's a bad beaver. The big, fat beaver is a big, fat communist. He's a big, fat, bad beaver. Yeah. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Yeah. Oh, jeez. No, well, you had to go there. Well, in addition, in addition, <laughs> this, this is also... 
you know, for crying out loud, it's the reason that John Lennon wrote, I am the walrus. People kept insisting... That it meant something. That everything he wrote had this deep philosophical, there's there's something to puzzle out and everything. Like, no, and no. when he insisted that they were, they said that he... Then the, you know, so many fans kept insisting there was, and he was like, all right, show me the meaning in this. And gave him, I am the walrus. <laughs> <laughs> I became very intrigued by Orson Welles because... Mm. Not because I respected him. I, I respect him as an artist. I definitely know for a fact I would never have wanted to work with him. You know, actors, you smokers, you wouldn't know the church. Out of the theater, if it smacked you in the mouth. Shut up, Orson, or I'll smack you in the Fuck mouth. Fuck you, John. Ever. Admitted, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> that's always been the fact. He's, he's one of those people who is a brilliant artist, and if you've ever seen any of his movies, you know that he was a brilliant, brilliant artist. But unfortunately, yeah, he was a person who... Not only did he own the room, he made sure to rent out anyone who set foot in the room. He made mm -hmm. sure that people were were kissing his hand. And, you know... Held court every yeah, possible moment. The finished product he always got was always something interesting to look at. I've seen some great uh, film performances of people as Orson Welles. Um, I mentioned uh, RKO 281 with uh, Liev Schreiber. Outstanding. Me and Orson Welles, a film with uh, Zac Efron. Um, but Angus... Angus McFadden as Wells, I think, is probably still my favorite. And I think a lot of it has to do with his back and forths with Carrie Always. I hate the set. It's a nightmare. A brilliant idea. Poorly executed. I've always said the play would work I'm better on a bear stage. Actually, Holly said that. No, I said it No, first. you didn't. Yes, I did. You did. Yes, I did. No, you yes, did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Oh, yes, I did. Fine, oh, Jack. You win. You got the biggest creative dick, okay? Thank you. Cool. You know, oh, I, I believe in the party of ideas. No, you just believe in the idea of a party, sparkling wet, Jack. Leaving. You can't leave. You're the producer. That's right. And as the producer, I can fire the member IPs. And I am fucking fired. You'll come crawling back like a bitch on heat to his master. Carry always. It's a thing. It's a thankless role. I mean, he's and he's one little one one smaller character amidst this wealth of other performers and and true tell a um a, a tribute to a really really good performance uh and i love um princess bride mm. and i don't know how long it was before i read oh that's carrie always okay yeah that's honestly the gift of carrie always and that's why i'm yeah. always that's why i'm always delighted to see him even when he's in garbage like the oogie loves oh god It's still just hilarious the fact that he dedicates himself to doing something like that. <laughs> but the, but even in a role like this, where he is basically playing second fiddle to Angus McFadden, and he still stands mm. out, yeah. is a testament to him. But I think the one that definitely deserves some attention, of course, is Bill Murray, because this was, yeah, this was around the time of like his big creative revolution. This is like around the time he had just fresh off the heels of Rushmore, which really got him a lot of um, artist uh, critical praise. And this is a little, about a year or two before he did uh, Lost in Translation. So, but this was another one that established Bill Murray as a as a legitimate actor beyond just his comedic roots. Because I think prior to this, he was kind of running himself into the ground with movies like Larger Than Life and The Man Who Knew Too Little. So, the fact that he bounced back and he started doing fair like this. And there were certain ones I think didn't he do like the, the Razor's Edge? Actually, no. There was a Quick Change, which was which was the movie he directed. It, the thing that mm -hmm. I that I loved and I was just about to ask when you mentioned apparently Bill Murray did learn to be a really passable ventriloquist. He did actually, and if, with no star, with no snark, honestly, try it. I know, just try it. I, I, it's it's difficult, but you know, if you can actually try it, you actually like will do good with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just I'm, I'm dabbling. It's possible, but you see, you, yeah. know, it's, you know, you think that you're you might be able to speak without. Uh, Without moving on to lips, yeah, yeah, but it's still... Yeah. Well, it's not just about the lips, it's about like your tongue. That's right. That's right, yeah. Like, like, you know. Yeah. Well, with him saying... Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry you. to every ventriloquist. We are not actual yeah. licensed ventriloquists. Yeah. We're you know, doing more hand puppetry, but the two that come in, Jack well, Black and... Jack Black and Kyle, yeah, friggin' no. <laughs> Tenacious D, before there was ever a Tenacious D, are in this movie. Try again. Now who's the dummy? Now who's the dummy? Now who's the dummy? Now who's the dummy? Back of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> even with even with teaching hand puppetry, I the thing that always you know always bothers me is doing this. And I was like, you know, I'm I'm curious. You know, when you when you speak, do you move like this? And and people said, you know, no, of course not. I was like, then why the hell are you, you making me do it? Do it? <laughs> 
It's like, this is what you do. And even if I'm not mistaken, I mean, that yeah. kind of puppeteering would be like something like this. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, it showed the, the, the inexperience and or the apathy of the person training yeah. them that they're using hand puppet moves that they won't even be using in the act. Mm. <laughs> apathy. There's another good word to segue into the, the in, next topic. Focusing on Hearst, uh, Rockefeller, and um, Philip Baker Hall's character, Mathers. I just recently reviewed the movie Velvet Buzzsaw. Uh, it's a new one on Netflix, and it's a satire of the, pretty much the apathy of the people who buy the art, the people who deal the art. You, you, you get the vibe they don't really give a damn about the art, just the prestige of owning the art. Yeah. And there's a whole, and there's a whole focus on their side, where Susan Sarandon's character, Margarita Sarfati, who's there to deal art for uh, Mussolini, and there's a whole bit where she goes to each of their houses when they get the art. She's like, do you like it? Do you like it? Yeah, and, he's, and they're all just like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, and they put it up there. And and the fact that they're, you know, we're not talking about some independent, he's talking about Da yeah, Vinci, yeah, for crying out Yeah, loud. Philip Baker Hall's character you gets a Da Vinci. You own a Da Vinci. You're owning a Da Vinci, and you're talking about something as trivial as putting it above your fireplace in your, in your, lip, in your study. A place that basically no one's going to be able to well, see this thing. Well, it goes with thing. the color scheme, after all. Yeah. And it's, it's like, you, you basically have just turned a vital work from a vital artist into nothing more than a... Well, you turn it into a little... To this. And you see her lament the fact that she knows that... Actually, it kind of goes back to the prostitution angle, is the fact that she knows that she has basically forfeit her right to be passionate about anything and in the end just trading around art as if it's just if anything else another investment and there's even a scene where Hearst is exchanging money with Phil Baker Hall's character where he's saying I'm not you know I'm only buying art and you realize that in the end this is actually just a money exchange yeah they're, this is him buying him off and they're just using the art as an excuse to legitimize right. it sickening the idea that they're they're, that, u- they're using they're, great art as the rag to launder the dirty money, and they're using the, and they're using the art to make themselves look culture. They're making them making it to to look like they actually are people of considerable depth and insight. When in reality, they are just they are probably the biggest whores of the bunch. So, occasionally sweet, occasionally bitter. So bittersweet. This one definitely on the menu.